Hello, everyone. This is our post-landing news conference for Space Shuttle Discovery. And we have with us our entire STS-133 flight crew. And we'll turn it over now to Steve Lindsay, our mission commander. Steve? Hi. Well, thanks for coming today. Um, it was a great day to come back and land in Florida. We're happy to bring Discovery home after 365 days on orbit. And uh, so you probably don't want to hear a big, long speech from me, so I think I'll just turn it over to questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We just have a brief time with the crew, so if you'll just ask one question, and if we do have time, we'll come back around, but it's just, just a single question. And we'll start uh, here in the front with Marsha. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Mike Leinbach told us just a little while ago that he didn't notice any big emotional outbursts or tears on the runway. But my question for you is, were there any tears among you? How, how emotional was it for you to bring Discovery home for the last time and, and walk away? Uh, you know, as hard as I, as I thought it would be, it was hard to leave the uh, flight deck when we were all done. At least for me it was. Um, and, uh, you know, we were focused today on bringing it home safely. We were really working hard, uh, working hard the whole mission. And so we didn't really have a whole lot of time to reflect about that. But uh, I did notice when I was on the ramp looking around, you know, walking around afterwards that as the minutes passed, I kind of got more and more sad looking at the, the vehicle and how healthy it is and how how wonderful it performed, and not just in this flight, but er, you know the other two flights that I flew on it, as well as every other flight. You know, it, it kind of got sadder for me, I think, as the uh, as the minutes rolled past. Todd. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today for uh, Nicole. Um, you worked on uh, Discovery here at the uh, Kennedy Space Center during the mission. You thought you might get choked up, and there might be some tears. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, landing discovery here for its uh, 39th and final flight. Yeah, I think, you know, following on with what uh, Steve said, um, for me, you know, I, I feel like I have an emotional tie to um, discovery to the space shuttles and to KSC especially. And I think, um, you know, it was kind of neat today while we were in, still in the spacecraft, still on the flight deck, I mean, we ran through almost every step of closing the vehicle down before it gets uh, handed over to the convoy team um, that you could. And uh, we had our astronaut support person up there who, you know, would normally, you know, get us out of there and, um, and then take over that uh, for us. But I think it just felt kind of good to, you know, to bring it as far as we could um, here at Kennedy. And walking around under the vehicle, I saw so many familiar faces. You know, so much of that, you know, that passion that we talk about that people have working on these vehicles that, you know, that's where it really, really was starting to, to hit home for me. And I think more, the more time I have to talk to more of those people, um, you know, the, the more emotional or the more, um, uh, the more of an impact it's going to have. And uh, I, I have to say again, though, just how, um, just how great it is to see that these people with that passion have the pride that goes along with it and are happy for every day they've had to work here and wouldn't trade it for anything. So, thanks. Yes, uh, over here in the front. <coughs> Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Uh, for Steve Bowen, uh, your previous crew, the first last crew of Atlantis uh, before leaving Atlantis, <laughs> left uh, um, your decal on board with your signature. We don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if, if you might have done the same on this vehicle as a crew or if you did any other activities that were commemorative of nature to, to mark discovery. Uh, actually, Steve made a really flight. good point about that. You really want to leave the vehicle in the condition that it existed in so that people can understand and see it once you put it on display in the, uh, in the format that it was, with the way we worked on it, the way the technicians put it together, the way the engineers saw it. And so I really didn't want to leave anything there to, 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 to really mar it in any way. Uh, Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent Newspaper. Uh, Bill Gersten Meyer has shared with us on several occasions in the last few weeks that there are some sort of negotiations or discussions going on about having a commercial company take over one or more of the shuttle vehicles. And I wondered if you had a comment for us about the airworthiness and the, the, um, the appropriateness of continuing to operate the shuttle vehicles uh, for the next five, ten years? Let's see. Um, 
and, and yeah, I know about the proposal um, that uh, that's out there as part of, you know, there's multiple commercial proposals out there, and that's one of the proposals. Um, as far as, um, you know, the, the viability of that with the, you know, the competition, you know, that's going on right now, we are not privy to that, so I really can't answer that question. As far as being able to fly the shuttles five, ten, me, ten years more, um, it's certainly it's certainly doable. The question is, do we have the uh, do, do we have the resources to be able to to pay to do that? In terms of what it can do, um, you know, I believe two flights a year would would keep the station uh, fully supplied, up mass and down mass. Um, so, from a space station standpoint, it obviously obviously be very advantageous to do that. Um, w you know, the, the agency and the nation has chosen to go in a little bit different direction here, and so. So we'll have to see how all that plays out. But as far as it being able to fly five or ten years more, you know, I think uh, the fact that Discovery landed today in perfect condition tells you that it could. So it's robust enough. It's robust enough to do that. I think it's robust enough. I mean, you have to take really good care of it. You really have to check everything. You have to uh, very much attention to detail and very, very good management of everything. And, and you really have to stay vigilant uh, with any spacecraft, and, and the shuttle is certainly no exception. So I think if you're very disciplined about how you do that, like we are now, um, and, and do our very best to do that, yeah, I think it's viable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. This question is for anybody. Um, can you give us an update on when the Robonaut might be unpacked? And also tell us about your experiences of, of seeing the space station with all those vehicles there. Anybody? Well, uh, as for Robonaut, uh, we were the delivery team for that as a technology demonstrator and will help us try to figure out what a anthropomorphic or a humanoid type robot can do for us. It's a very early prototype, but I think just by having a form that's more resembling of us, it excites a little bit of, uh, of imagination. Um, I think Dr. Coleman will be unpacking Robonaut sometime in the next uh, very few weeks. Hopefully we've uh, s accelerated that a little bit by getting them ahead on some of the other tasks. As to seeing the station, as you know, uh, Nicole and I actually lived up there long term for a while. I spent 197 days, I think, up there in 2009. Uh, it was a magnificent stack at that time. It was my home. It was a laboratory. It was an incredible place to live and to view the Earth. And I couldn't imagine it being bigger or better, but it is. It's, uh, it was a few modules bigger. We delivered yet another module. And of course, we had the uh, Japanese and the European transport vehicles there. And with the addition of the cupola, it's even more magnificent than I left it. I didn't think that possible. It's breathtaking. And the view we get from the shuttle, as opposed to what I saw from the Soyuz, uh, is just magnificent. It's, it's almost unbelievable that we put that much mass and that much pressurized volume up there. Hi, James Fink with Plainville Citizen. Uh, you know, I've got four children at home that uh, are very excited about what you've been doing, one of which declared that she's going to be an astronaut when she saw your, you launch the other day. I was wondering if any of you had some words of encouragement for our next generation of astronauts that are looking forward to what NASA is going to bring us next. Well, let me start that and then <laughs> hand that over. Uh, because I have five children. Uh, <coughs> gotcha. Uh, that's right. One, one is thinking about it. Um, th the first thing is that when you look at the people involved in the business of space right now in the U.S., we're, we're doing a lot of hand-wringing and nail-biting about what our next step could be, should be. Uh, that will gel out. I'm not too worried about that. So the first news for the kids is don't get caught up in that. Um, look at what we have. We have an international partner who's able to launch us up there and back. We have three countries now putting men in orbit. We have a magnificent station that's just really at the end of its assembly phase, so starting its utilization phase. Uh, we've got telescopes that are finding planets like crazy in other solar systems. I don't think there's ever been a better time to think about being an astronaut. As far as commercial space for us, the more space, the better. And the world that your children grow up in is going to be, I think, much more rich in some ways than others. We won't maybe have these magnificent shuttles, which have done such a great job of building the station and other things. But um, there, there will be space flight. There will be a lot to do. Well, anybody else? I, I look at it as uh, this is a transition period. And like all transition periods, like in aviation, after World War I, we had, a, we had airplanes, but we really didn't know what to do with them. If you ask someone back in that era, what are we going to do with uh, an airplane? A lot of a lot of people would say not much. There's not much to do with them. And then we had the Roaring Twenties, and the time period where airplanes came along and kept we kept pushing the edge and pushing the envelope. And now, if I ask someone what's what do you, what's an airplane good for, people could name thousands of things. And that's how space is going the same way. We're we're kind of in this 
transition period, and there's always uncertainty in transition periods. That's just the name of the game. But I have no doubt in my mind that we're going to be moving on to the Mars, Moon, every, all those places we'll be exp exploring the, the, the solar system at first, and someday we'll be exploring the, the galaxy. So it's just a matter of time, just when or, or you know, where, when are we going to get to these next steps, and any transition period can be challenging. Denise Chow with Space.com. A question for Alvin Drew. Um, on your first spacewalk, you became the 200th person to uh, work in the vacuum of space. I was just wondering if you could um, characterize what that experience was like for you. First and foremost, I was just glad to be part of a, that, that club of spacewalkers. The number really wasn't that important to me. As far as I was concerned, there's really two big names in spacewalking. There's Alexa Leonov, the first person to actually go out in space, and Ed White, who obviously didn't have the, ex the benefit of Alexa Leonov's experience because of the Cold War. <laughs> who became the first American to go out into space, and the rest of us are all tied for third place as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, but it was, a, it was a wonderful experience to go out there. Uh, for me, it was uh, uh, the sense of going out there. I think we were, I don't know if we were the African or the Amazon jungle. Uh, we went outside, but I just remember being struck by the sunlight, the clouds, and the, um, these broad, uh, wide brown rivers down beneath, and just, uh, just being just taken aback by the whole thing and reminding myself, okay, I've got six and a half hours worth of work to do in about seven and a half hours worth of things to get done in that six and a half hours, so I better you know, take in the view, remind myself, remember what it was, and then press on uh, quickly and get, get the job done. Um, that was fun, of course, getting the jobs done uh, after two spacewalks is very gratifying, um, a very satisfying thing to do. James? James? <clears throat> Excuse me, James Dean with Florida today. Uh, Steve, At Atlantis is launching in a little over a month, so plenty of time to jump into that flow if the uh, <laughs> opportunity arises. But uh, um, I, I wondered if any of you could talk about how uh, you said that uh, Tim was uh, up there with you guys in more than spirit. Well, he actually helped us do the EVAs on the ground, which I greatly appreciated. You know, just having him in mission control uh, just to be able to, to, to question things and know that if I was doing something that wasn't quite right, he was going to step in and help me out. That was, I greatly appreciated that. And so he was definitely there with us outside when we were uh, doing our spacewalks, and that was fantastic to have him there. Yeah, I mean, he was with us every day the whole time we were there. I mean, he was, he was a big part of this mission from the very beginning. You know, as you, as you go through the training process for a mission and you develop this mission, um, as a crew, you're involved in that whole development process. So he was involved, um, you know, obviously through the spacewalks because he, he led the development of those. And that, that actually enabled Steve to jump in with, what, a month to go and, and to go train those spacewalks and do them successfully. Additionally, he was uh, our, our um, MS-2 flight engineer uh, on the flight deck and trained alongside uh, 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 Al and Nicole in those positions for ascent and entry. And all of his work in developing the crew coordination allowed Alan Nicole to take uh, his 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 role on the flight deck as well, and 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 be able to do that. So, you know, everything we did, Tim touched, and so he was with us all the time. And uh, you know, we we really wish he could have been there with us. That's all the crew will have time for right now. They're on a uh, rather limited schedule this evening, so. That will be our final question, and that will conclude this press briefing and our STS-133 mission coverage. Thank you. Thank you.